Well, I would like to welcome everyone here this evening. I'm quite excited about this event that has been um, planned, and I think it's going to be quite an extraordinary evening for all of us. So my name is Marilyn Fowler. I'm faculty emeritus with EWP. And um, so this particular event is also connected to a course that I think has just finished, and I know that there are a number of students in that course here this evening, and that is EWP 6115, the Systems View of Life. So that course and this event are connected, and all of it is sponsored by the East West Psychology Department. So tonight we have a rather unique opportunity to visit and witness two great minds in conversation. So this is a conversation between the Systems View of Life and East West Psychology. <coughs> and it is also our opportunity to look at how these forces are currently shaping these critical times that we live in. And so I, um, I, I myself have been very interested in attending, and now I'm moderating. So <laughs> I guess I am also attending. So in any case, welcome very much, and I'm delighted to have you all with us. So I would like to start by introducing our two speakers. Sit and Debashish. Banjur, not energy, excuse me, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. Um, is of course someone who needs no introduction to the East West audience. So, Dabashish is the Haridas Chaudhry Professor of Indian Philosophies and Culture and the Doshi Professor of Asian Art at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He's also the program chair of East West Psychology. His interests are in cross-cultural approaches to Indian philosophy, psychology, and culture. Banerjee has authored and edited several books on thought leaders of modern India, such as Rabindranath Tagore and Abhinindranath Tagore, and also Sri Aurobindo. He has also curated a number of exhibitions of Asian art. His last two authored books are Seven Quartets of Becoming, a transformational yoga psychology based on the diaries of Sri Aurobindo, and Meditations on the Isha Upanishad, tracing the philosophical vision of Sri Aurobindo. <coughs> and next to him is, of course, Fritzav Kapra, PhD, a scientist, educator, activist, and author of many international bestsellers that connect conceptual changes in science with broader changes in worldview and values in society. A Vienna-born physicist and systems theorist, Kapra first became popularly known for his book, The Tao of Physics, which I'm sure many of us in here have read, yes, which explored the ways in which modern physics was changing our worldview from a mechanistic to a holistic and ecological one. Over the past 30 years, Kapra has been engaged in a systematic exploration <coughs> of how other sciences and society are ushering in similar shifts in worldviews or paradigms, leading to a new vision of reality and a new understanding of the social implications of this cultural transformation. His most recent book, The System's View of Life, published by Cambridge University Press 2014, co-authored with Pierre Luigi Luisi, presents a grand new synthesis of this work, integrating the biological, cognitive, social, and ecological dimensions of life. Now, before I turn the microphones over to our two speakers, I just wanted to give you a, kind of an outline of, of the structure for the evening. So Fritzhoff is going to start us off and uh, with a few remarks about cognitive science and the system of view of life. And then uh, Debashish is going to um, add his perspectives on cognition, consciousness, psychology, and its implications for the future in this very difficult time we find ourselves. And then, then both of them will move into dialogue, which I think is going to be the most fascinating part of the evening. And, and then before we close, we, we also have time for questions from the audience. So if you have a burning question, or if you think of one while all of this is going on, please write it down. And um, then we'll have, you'll have an opportunity to ask that question, hopefully. 
uh, by the end of the evening. So that's the big plan. And so without further ado, I think I'm going to turn it over to Fritzel. Okay, thank you very much, Marilyn. Can, can you hear me? Is on? Uh, well, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be back at CIS, and thank you, Debashish, for making this possible and inviting me. I should mention that uh, I am uh, quite familiar with CIS. Uh, among the faculty are several old friends of mine, people like Stan Groff, Rick Tarnas, uh, Brian Swim, Charlene Spretnak, Alfonso Montuori, and, and there are others. And I've also been here and given several talks over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. So it's very nice to be back, but I'm not only back for this dialogue. I, as, as you heard, I, I just finished teaching a course here about the systems view of life, and I'm very happy that uh, most of my class is here tonight and uh, I expect them to shine in the discussions. <laughs> so, uh, and as you heard, this uh, title, The Systems View of Life, is also the title of the textbook that I wrote with my friend Pierluigi Luisi, which is really, for me, a grand synthesis of my whole work over the last 30 years or so. So uh, it is a synthesis, as Marilyn mentioned, of a new conception of life that emerged in science during the last 30 years or so. At the heart of this understanding of life, we find a fundamental change of metaphors from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. Now, a network, as everybody knows, is a certain pattern of links, of relationships. And therefore, in order to really understand networks, we have to learn how to think in terms of patterns and in terms of relationships. And in science, this has become known as systemic thinking or systems thinking. And this is why I call my synthesis the systems view of life. So the central insight of this <coughs> systemic understanding of life is the recognition that the network is the basic pattern of organization of all living systems. Ecosystems can be understood in terms of food webs, that is, networks of organisms. Organisms are networks of organs tissues, tissues are networks of cells, cells are networks of molecules. So the network is a pattern that is common to all life. Wherever you look at life, uh, you see networks. And then, of course, we have social networks, networks of communication, and so on. Now, a closer examination of these networks over the last 30, 40 years has shown that their key characteristic is that they are self-generating. In the cell, for example, all the biological structures, the DNA, the proteins, the membranes, all, all of these structures are constantly produced, repaired, and regenerated by the cellular network. So food comes in through the cell membrane in terms of small molecules, and out of these small molecules, these large proteins and other large molecules are built by the cellular network. And as soon as, for example, an enzyme is built by the cellular network, it, con it itself uh, contributes to producing other things in the cell. So in this way, the uh, cell constantly regenerates and reproduces itself. And that's also true for multicellular organisms. The cells in our body, for example, are continually uh, regenerated and recycled by the organism's metabolic network. So living networks continually create or recreate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. And in this way, they undergo continual change <coughs> 
while at the same time preserving the basic network pattern of organization. And this coexistence of stability and change is indeed a major characteristic of life. Well, let me now come <coughs> to uh, one of the most important and most radical <coughs> philosophical implications of this systems view of life. And this is a new conception of the nature of mind, which finally overcomes the Cartesian division between mind and matter that has haunted philosophers and scientists for centuries. You uh, will remember that in the 17th century, the great philosopher and mathematician René Descartes um, based his view of nature on the fundamental division between two separate and independent realms. One he called is that of mind, which he called the thinking thing, res cogitans in, in Latin, and the other one, matter, he called the extended thing, res extensa. And so he planted in the minds of philosophers and scientists in the subsequent centuries this fixed idea that the mind is a thing, because Descartes called it the thinking thing. And they, for hundreds of years they couldn't figure out how this thinking thing would interact with that other thing, matter, or the body. Well, the decisive advance of the system's view of life has been to recognize that mind is not a thing, but a process. And this novel concept of mind was developed in the 1960s independently by two scientists, Gregory Bateson, the great anthropologist and cyberneticist, who used the term mental process and independently Umberto Maturana who focused on cognition, the process of knowing. And then in the 1970s Maturana and his collaborator Francisco Varela working at the University of Chile in Santiago expanded Maturana's initial idea into a full theory of cognition which is now known as the Santiago theory. And the central insight of the Santiago theory of cognition is the identification of cognition, the process of knowing, with the very process of life. Cognition, according to Maturana and Varela, is the activity involved in the self-generation and self-perpetuation of living networks. In other words, cognition is the very process of life. The self-organizing activity of living systems at all levels of life is mental or cognitive activity. And therefore, the interactions of a living organism, plant, animal, human being, or even a microorganism, Interactions with the environment are always cognitive interactions. And so we see that life and cognition are inseparably connected. The process of cognition, or if you wish, of mind, is immanent in matter at all levels of life. Well, this, of course, is a radical extension of the traditional concept of cognition and implicitly of the concept of mind. In this new view, cognition involves the entire process of life, including perception, emotions, behavior, and does not even necessarily require a brain or a nervous system. Plants, for example, or even bacteria who don't have a nervous system, are constantly engaged in cognitive activities involving their sensory apparatus and various self-organizing processes. So, cognition is <clears throat> the very essence of the process of living, 
Now, in science, when you advance such a hypothesis, which is very radical, you also have to show that it does something for you. It has to be effective, otherwise it's just a play with words. And uh, the best way of showing that with the Santiago theory is by revisiting the thorny uh, question of the relationship between the mind and the brain. This has confused scientists and philosophers for centuries, even you know, in the last few decades. But in the Santiago theory, this relationship is very simple and clear. The Cartesian concept of mind as a thing is abandoned. Mind or cognition is a process, the <coughs> process of life. And the brain is a specific structure through which this process plays itself out. But the brain is not the only structure, as I just said. Organisms without brains are also involved in cognitive activity. But their biological structures are the structures that, uh, in which this process of cognition takes place. So the relationship between mind and matter, or mind and body, is one between process and structure. Now, cognition, as I mentioned, in this Santiago theory, is associated with all levels of life. And therefore, it's a much broader concept than consciousness. Consciousness, in the sense of conscious lived experience, unfolds at certain levels of cognitive complexity that require a brain and a higher nervous system. In other words, consciousness is a special kind of cognitive process that emerges when cognition reaches a certain level of complexity. And the central characteristic of this a uh, special type of cognition is the experience of self-awareness. To be aware not only of the environment, which is true for all cognition, but to be in, in aware of oneself. Now, many details of this science of mind and consciousness, and in particular as far as consciousness is concerned, many details still need to be clarified and integrated. However, we now have the outlines of a scientific theory that overcomes the division between mind and matter. As far as I know, the only scientific theory that does that. And uh, so mind and matter no longer appear to belong to two separate categories, but can be seen as representing two complementary aspects of the, the phenomenon of life, the process aspect and the structure aspect. So at all levels of life, mind and matter, process and structure are inseparably connected. For the first time, we have a scientific theory that unifies mind, matter, and life. Well, <clears throat> during the past three decades, the study of mind from this systemic perspective mind as a process that is fundamentally embodied has blossomed into a rich interdisciplinary field known as cognitive science. Leading researchers in this field include, and I'm going to read off a bunch of names, Francisco Varela, Gerald Edelman, Giulio Tononi, David Chalmers, Antonio Damasio, George Lakoff, Mark Johnson, and there are many others. You may have heard or be familiar with some of those names. So these researchers emphasize that cognitive science transcends the traditional frameworks of psychology, biology, and philosophy. So the question I have, and which I propose to Devashish to discuss tonight, is where does this leave psychology? What does this radical view of cognition imply for psychology? And on the other hand, what does psychology contribute to the system's view of cognition? And uh, you know, most of the time when I give lectures and I ask questions, 
I know the answers because they're rhetorical questions. But believe me, I don't know the answers to this question. So I look forward to a genuine discussion, to genuinely learning something. Thank you. Thank you, Fritjof. So I don't know if uh, we can solve that question here today, but there's an audience as well, and I hope that there will be rich uh, collective dialogue on this. But I'd like to first say a few words about our department and what it does and how that relates to what you're doing. Uh, so East-West Psychology is a department of the California Institute of Integral Studies found with the aim of bringing psychological models and frameworks of Eastern and indigenous peoples into engagement with Western psychology as a corrective to the reductive view of traditional Western psychology. The discipline of psychology literally means the science of the soul. Since the founding of the modern discipline of psychology in the European Enlightenment, psyche has been reduced to mind. Since the late 20th century, Jungian depth psychology and humanistic and transpersonal psychologies have questioned this reduction, identifying non-mental and non-ordinary states of consciousness and developing frameworks and methodologies to study and include these in its expanded view of the psyche. East-West psychology sees itself as furthering this effort. We acknowledge many forms and models of human knowing and action and keep open the question, what is the psyche? At present, East-West psychology conducts its studies and researches in four principal areas. These form a fourfold cardinal system, that of East, meaning Eastern psychospiritual models and experiences, West, meaning Jungian and transpersonal directions in psychology, Earth, meaning indigenous shamanistic and eco-psychological approaches, and world, meaning our efforts at integration and including social, cultural, decolonial, whole person, and integral psychologies. We are very happy and grateful to include Fritjof Capra's work on the system's view of life as an important part of our world psychology component. Capra, a world-famous theoretical physicist who pioneered a revolution in modern thought with his book, The Tao of Physics, has moved on to account for an integral view of cosmos based in an attempt to identify universal patterns in a process of cosmic organization. I don't need to speak for him as he has so cogently explained his work in a nutshell. Drawing on the life process work of Maturana and Varela, he sees processes of self-organization at work from the most fundamental building blocks of matter to the most complex feedback loops of society and culture, today a global interdependence. This is seen by him as an embodied continuous process in which cognition and creativity are present from bottom up. Emergent properties characterize networks of increasing complexity, <coughs> giving them identifying qualities of their own. Consciousness here is seen as one of these emergent properties of cognition, appearing in living beings and marked by self-awareness. I realize that this definition of consciousness is not necessarily the same as held, for example, by certain Eastern frameworks for which consciousness is the fundamental ontological substrate which has become all things. Nor is it so for indigenous understandings, where consciousness may reside in apparently non-living or in disembodied spirit entities. But this is a matter of semantic convention. East-West psychology accepts frameworks for what they are and favors comparative translations across boundaries. Hence, it is important to see Fritjof's model in its own terms for what it offers our understanding of psychology. Firstly, it participates in challenging the reduction of conscious processes to mind. As a result of, or rather it, uh, you use the term mind, so you actually pluralize the idea of mind, or you give another definition of mind. As a result of critical importance to our times, it decenters the modern subject from its right to hegemony over the planet 
based on its self-conception of privilege as the supreme creation of God or nature for whose benefit all others were made. This idea, which has led us to a very sorry state of climate crisis, cultural violence, and severe race, gender, and class inequalities in a tightly interdependent world is the legacy of the European Enlightenment, interpreted in an anthropocentric way. Capra's model of universal cognitive autopoiesis makes for a participatory and creative cosmos in which humanity also participates along with and alongside all other living and non-living processes. Human cognition or human consciousness here adds emergent levels of material and non-material complexity due to the power of symbolic communication and technology use at the service of social unifications. This revised understanding of the human role in the systemic process of the universe results in a new ethics of participation, which, if understood and accepted, can perhaps reverse the mess in which we find ourselves today as by a wrong turn of history. Such a view, in line with chaos and complexity theories on one hand and with feminist understandings on the other, is a welcome move for East-West psychology. We may push further, however, the understanding of human consciousness as developed by Capra. What characterizes human consciousness in terms of emergence? If consciousness is characterized by self-awareness, in humans the degree of consciousness reaches reflexivity. Human cognition is also is able to turn on itself with a number of consequences. The first of these is a strong sense of separate and unique identity in each individual, a mental construction of reflexivity, which we call ego. This subdues or separates in the human some of the ways in which life conducts its business of participation in non-human life processes. A thing to note is that the exchange processes in non-human life forms seem to follow an intuition of natural cons conservation and unity, which excessive reflexivity has ruptured in human experience. Either we can ignore this, and take our stand on the mental ego as our human identity, an identification which has led us to our modern view of being the subject of the rest of the world, given to us as God's favorites for exploitation. Or we can acknowledge this and recognize the many kinds of consciousness which operate in us and which we can empower emotional, volitional, somatic, and psychic forms of knowing are not the same as mental cognition and include intuitive understandings that can relate us to the unitive processes of nature. These are available to humans, but they need disciplined attention, practice, and coordination or integration to activate against the grain of mental domination. East-West psychology promotes a scientific study of such forms of understanding and processes to explore and empower these alternative kinds of consciousness. Another consequence of mental reflexivity is a sense of freedom. Or if our discussion of anthropocentrism implies a sense of freedom with negative consequences, human freedom can also be creative. Human consciousness affords a larger scope to our relation with time, space, and the perception of order. This is what makes us plan, philosophize, and come up with large-scale solutions to our problems, such as the system's view of life. Behind this kind of operation of the mind, too, one may discover an intuition of order and unity. Opening and empowering such an intuition can offer us a philosophical sense of the whole and of our participation in it. The settling of such an intuition is not a given, and the teaching of ethics is not enough to establish it. As we know, ever since Freud theorized the model of the human psyche in which the conscious mind is just the tip of the iceberg, 
visible above the enormous mass of the unconscious, human beings defeat their best intentions due to their impotence in the face of their own nature. To overcome this, East-West psychology believes not just in pedagogy or therapy for socializing the ego, but in studying forms of practice that address the deep structure of the psyche and have developed means to transform the nature and liberate the creative and intuitive dimensions of mental freedom. Finally, we come to the property of spirituality. Spirituality is a vast field and EWP does not believe in flattening it to some homogeneous perennialism. But it is a matter of experience, which has a cosmic dimension to it. The ways to this experience and the forms of these experiences may be many. Yet even though embodied, these are experiences of a cosmic consciousness that exceeds and includes the human. Capra wrote about just such an experience in his first and best-selling book an experience that put the final note of conviction to his revolutionary disclosures in physics. To me, sitting in Bombay, reading his book in my early 20s, what stood out was not the new conception that Fritjof was talking about, but the fact that it could be experienced in consciousness and had been for centuries, which is why Fritjof described it using an image from Indian philosophy, the dance of Shiva. Experiences of this kind can change the composition of our psyche. Bringing a unitive intuition to the front in all our dealings. I'm not sure if Fritjof will agree with me, but I feel it is very likely that his trajectory as an explorer and thinker of the system's view may be a continuing inspiration derived from that experience. Yet not all who have such experiences retain their conclusions as an enduring change in their psyche or their minds. This is why world traditions and transpersonal psychology have tried to develop systems and disciplines to make them settle and endure in us as states of being. East-West psychology seeks to make available the exploration and study of these disciplines, which, in my opinion, are the sure way to allow the integrative impulse of the system's view to not only be a good idea, but a realization. Devashish, you have vastly expanded the field now, <laughs> and uh, I feel that uh, we could spend the whole semester teaching a course <laughs> together, going into these points, yes. which you, uh, you know, just uh, thrown out in, in a few minutes. So uh, I think uh, we need to concentrate on, on a few points and. Uh, uh, I'm not sure where to begin, but uh, what interested me most when I prepared for this evening uh, was to ask you, since you know the systems view of life so well and this concept of cognition, in all these fields of psychology that you study and teach here, yeah. uh, are there schools that deal with the mind as fundamentally embodied. I'm very interested in that. And which, so, which ones are there? Yeah, so Fritjof, I'd say, uh, actually, you make a few really good points. One is that of a process, mind as a process, or cognition as a process. And uh, I think most of our, the, both the Eastern and the ancestral, or the indigenous ways of thinking, see cognition as happening at every level. But uh, cognition is of different kinds. You also note that, you know that in terms of emergence. So what happens is that, but so most of these schools are also talking about disembodied consciousness or disembodied cognition, if you want to call it that. We don't need to go there, you know, because psychology is really first and foremost about 
the study of what we can experience. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say, if you talk about disembodied uh, mind or disembodied consciousness, you, you cannot be scientific because it cannot be empirically based. If it's disembodied by definition, how does it interact with the body? You're back into the cup. You know, two realms, mind, mind and matter. Not necessarily. I mean, so for example, uh, two kinds. One is uh, out-of-body experiences or, uh, you know, experiences of spirits or spirit entities. Uh, are disembodied beings or disembodied forms of consciousness that can interact with us? So, but so, do, so does my mother in my dreams, who yeah, died but, 20, yeah, so, 30 years ago. Right. So, so, Pritchard, so that is a dream, and this is not necessarily a dream. The question of whether it is the same as a dream or not is a validation system of its own. Yeah. So we have to develop the criteria by which we can validate whether this is a dream or not. Yeah. It's a more sophisticated discourse yeah. than just reducing yeah. it to a dream. Yeah. So that is also part of the yeah. science of parapsychology tried to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Parapsychology hasn't had a really good, you know, sort of season yeah. in yeah. modern yeah. science. Yeah. But nevertheless, these are ways which we keep open over here at least. I see. Well, Let's not go into this, okay? okay? <laughs> but let's come back to, to the embodied view of cognition yeah. Yeah. and the process view. Yeah. And, and you said there are several schools and, and you yeah, said indigenous uh, uh, ideas of cognition would, would distinguish between several levels. I would very much it agree would, with that. Yeah, it would distinguish between kinds of consciousness, you know, all kinds of consciousness are not the same, and you could call it levels or you could call it varieties. Yeah, yeah, and, and where I would draw a difference is that typically indigenous traditions uh, would not distinguish between living and non-living. They would say that a stone also has some kind of sure. consciousness. Sure. Now, in, in the Santiago school, we would say no, because uh, there is a definite uh, order of self-organization that goes with cognition, which stones don't have. And one, one characteristic is that those are open systems that need a continuous flow of energy and matter. If you put a rock into a vacuum for a week, it comes out as the same rock. If you put a rabbit into a vacuum for a week, it dies. So that's the big, therefore, you know, a stone is not cognitive. That's where I would draw the distinction. Right. I think, I think cognitive processes don't express themselves. But this is the old, what is called the heart problem of consciousness. Yes. That is, uh, we feel, it feels like something to be you or to be me. How do we know that it doesn't feel like something to be a stone? Mm -hmm. It may not express itself. But we can't know that, you see. Yeah. So that becomes a question of, I mean, you, you might call it a question of philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Because, because there's no way of yeah, knowing. If it, if it does not express itself, yeah. then for me as a scientist, yeah. I have no data. Yeah, but, but in the indigenous point of view, it does express itself. And there is communication possible. Yeah. So communication between the living and the non-living uh, whether the non-sentient or the disembodied uh, is something that is attested to. So the question is, is it a figment of the imagination or is it true? And if we, if we you know, the lines that we draw are the lines of our frameworks. We cannot yeah. really know. Yeah. And I think they're valid to yeah. draw these lines in different frameworks. Yeah. They arrive at different kinds of uh, Systems yeah. of validation. Yeah. I was going to actually begin with that and say that what I'm presenting in the systems view yeah. of life is a scientific model or a scientific theory. Yeah. And like all scientific theories, it's not the truth. Sure. It yeah. is a description of reality, right. a limited and approximate description, and we have to see within which context sure, it sure. works. 
I, so I, that's, I agree. That's all yeah. that's, uh, yeah. Now, I want to come to something that, that you mentioned, which, which I didn't uh, expect, and I think it's extremely important. And that is when you talked about excessive reflexivity, which has uh, led us to uh, separate ourselves from nature. Yeah. This is what I like to call the human condition, the basic dilemma of the human condition, yeah. that we have human consciousness has evolved this capability of abstraction, which has given us conceptual thought, poetry, art, uh, you know, philosophy. The, the pyramids, philosophy, science, mm -hmm. but it also has led us uh, to kill each other for you know, religious ideals and things like that. Sure. This uh, is also a very dangerous subject. And I think to explore this excessive reflexivity or the human condition, that alone would be worth your whole department, I think. <laughs> if, you did, if you did just that, you know? Because it's such an important question. Yes, yes. And are you, are you exploring this in, in various courses? And yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, yeah, we are. Courses. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the, the, the other aspect of that, Fritjof, is that, uh, you know, when, when you talk about mind at different levels, uh, we can talk about a single process of cognition at different levels, with different degrees and emergent yeah. properties. Yeah. Uh, when, when one comes to the human mind, this separation that takes place due to excessive reflexivity actually creates this you know, division into different types of consciousness. Because before that you can call it all one thing, but yeah. suddenly now it is as if something has split itself off. Yeah. And we can see, you know, when you talk about networks, there is a fundamental difference between natural networks, like let's say uh, a beehive or other kinds of networks, where a certain unity is conserved. Even the entire ecosystem, without the human, conserves a certain, you know, homeostasis. Things die, things are born. In the, so there is an intuition of unity which is conserved. With the human, with that excessive, you know, reflexivity, we split ourselves off from that, yeah. and we tamper with that unity. So the thing is to get back to that. There are, you know, we have to talk about other kinds of consciousness that we have subordinated, that are in us, yeah, that we can return to in a way, and we can find that unity again. You know, if if you if you want to take a a cosmic perspective or an evolutionary perspective yeah. Yeah. of uh, you know the last two or three billion years, uh, then you can say that nature has evolved these very subtle networks where every member participates and the whole is conserved yeah. through billions of years of evolution. Sure. And our human arrogance of splitting ourselves up off maybe very short lived and the lived and in the grand evolutionary scheme it's just a blip and and if we don't make it then nature will say well this one hasn't worked you know let's try something else <laughs> except as you know we are in the what's called the anthropocene yeah yeah we, we, we've put our footprint on nature yeah, yeah. to such an extent that before nature says that we may destroy it yeah, yeah. i wanted but to mention still. some uh, more 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 technical aspect. When you talk about different levels of consciousness and different levels of cognition, to me one of the great advantages of the Santiago theory is to realize that most cognition in nature is unconscious. And so you can make a contact with other modes that are not accessible to us because most of cognition is unconscious, even in the very complex human realm. And then you can make contact with Freud and Jung and, and various theories of the unconscious. So to me, that fits very beautifully in this broader concept of cognition. Sure, sure. I think that when we're talking about varieties of consciousness, they, when we use the word unconscious, we are actually thinking of it from the mind's point of view. But they have their own logic. Yes. They have their own operations. And I think if we know how to identify with these, we can communicate, as you're saying. That there can be communication at all these levels. Yeah. 
And that communication is critically important today in, to be able to talk across boundaries, not only disciplinary boundaries, yes. but boundaries of consciousness, boundaries of kinds of consciousness. I want to share something else with you. Do, do you know Brother David Steindl Rust? Is that? He is an, an Austrian who is a Benedictine monk and spiritual teacher, and he has been very influential on, on my thinking as far as spirituality is concerned. I wrote a book with him which is called Belonging to the Universe, which is sort of a, a Western version of the Tao of physics, you know, modern science and Christianity, and it's a dialogue I had with him. And he says something very interesting. He uh, defines um, spirituality of as an experience of heightened aliveness, because he goes back to the meaning of spirit as the breath of life. Mm -hmm. And so he says our spiritual moments are the ones that uh, where we feel most alive. And that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of personal experience. Sure. And also you can, he relates it to the Buddhist concept of mindfulness. And if spirituality is heightened aliveness, then in its very definition, it's related to the system's view of life. So to I me, mean, that's a very nice yeah, I, I, I think uh, that heightened aliveness you're talking about is connection uh, with something greater. Uh, you know, we talk about things yes, like cosmos. That is the experience. So, the, yeah. As if the entire cosmos, we, we even yeah. have experiences of expanding out of the body into something right. much larger. Right. Uh, so those so kinds he, of... He distinguishes between the state in which it occurs, yeah. which is heightened aliveness, yeah, yeah. and then the nature of the experience, right. which is connectedness and Correct. connectedness expansion and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, how are we doing? Shall we open it to uh, questions or...? I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, I think let's open it to questions and, and then take it from there. And you will be so kind of moderate the discussion? Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just um, a couple of ground rules here. <laughs> well, first of all, we would like to have as many people as possible be able to share their questions. And so to do that, we would appreciate it if you would be as succinct as possible and as clear as possible in your question. And if you could minimize the commentary that might precede the question or, or follow it. So, um, just those two very brief things, and then um, we're ready to go. Now, I think we already had one volunteer here, is that true? Yes. Okay, I'm going to give you the mic, and it's all yours. Sir, I'm good evening. Uh, it's quite a pleasure and an honor to meet both of you. Um, you know, I, I read your book 40 years ago as an 18-year-old in Jamaica. Did our physics, and it was the same time I was meeting people like Carlos Castaneda and um, Alan Watts and this kind of type of literature. And your, your book had a particularly deep influence on my life, and still does. <laughs> and I had no excuse me for saying this. I had no idea that you were still alive, <laughs> but I had put you like in my pantheon of brilliant minds and our physics in my kind of of holy books. You know? So it's really and anyway. So my question is this. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, Einstein came up with this theory of relativity, which kind of blew the whole scientific world open, and um, led, led to um, awareness of atomic physicists looking more into the more subtle aspects of, of reality, of, of matter, and the relationship between matter and spirit. And at the same time, W.E. B. Boys. Uh, made this bold statement that the problem of the 20th century will be the color line. Um, since that time, we've, we've had you know, a great movement in this expansion of consciousness, this East-West philosophy, and 125 years, 20 years after W.E. was made that statement, 
we are, the, the color line has now firmly established itself as white supremacy, mm -hmm. racism. Um, where, where do you see us going? And, and how can this enlightenment, this new enlightenment, how, how can this begin to address this problem that we have, which even contemporary thinkers like Naomi, Naomi Klein and people I respect see as a major contributing factor to, to, to the global climate crisis and myriad of other things, in, 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 including the present American political dilemma. How, how, how is this consciousness awakening going to help us, going to contribute to, to help us? Thank you. Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's a difficult question and certainly uh, these evolutionary changes don't happen in a linear way. If, if I uh, look back on my own life, um, then I could say, you know, I spent my childhood in the 40s, my youth in the 50s, my young adulthood in the 60s, and so on in the Tao of Physics I wrote in the 70s. And so in the 60s, there was this huge expansion of consciousness toward the spiritual and also toward the social in terms of protest movements and uh, questioning of authority and, and so on. Uh, this was mainly uh, a, uh, a protest and it, we didn't have a clear vision of an alternative. Then in the 70s, there were two big movements, the environmental movement and the feminist movement, which are sort of two pillars of a, a more coherent conceptual framework. Then in the 80s, uh, they uh, achieved the political dimension with the green movement, the green parties. And uh, this is when I wrote my book, The Turning Point. And at the end of the 1980s, I believe that now we were ready to take over the world with the new paradigm and the new values and so on. And you know, things were just moving on, on all fronts. Now remember 89 was the year when the Berlin Wall came down and Nelson Mandela was free. Gorbachev made a huge impact. So, so I was just wildly optimistic at, at that time. <laughs> then something happened in the 1990s which nobody foresaw and that was the information technology revolution, which brought us more interconnectedness, but also a new kind of global capitalism, a new materialism, new expressions of greed. And it took us the whole decade of the 90s to, to find our bearings again. That's at least my view. And at the very end, in 1999, we had the Seattle conference of the WTO and the the birth of a new global civil society. And so uh, in the last 20 years or so, this civil society has made a lot of progress, but the, the, the capitalist, uh, uh, patriarchal, racist, right-wing, supremacist uh, uh, wing of society that you mentioned is fighting back in a, in a very very organized way and, and is very resistant. So now it's a very critical time. But you can see that the new consciousness and new paradigm now you know, has millions of followers. Just uh, last week I got an email from Italy about the so-called Sardines movement. I don't know whether you've heard about this. There are m thousands of people, tens of thousands of people occupying the beautiful squares of Italy, protesting against the right-wing political movement of Sardinia and, and the right-wing politicians. And uh, just all, all the cities have, like, I saw a video of Florence, 40,000 people, you know, in a, in a square in Florence, massive movements. The same, you know, the, the movement that Greta Thunberg started with, you know, Fridays for the Future. Millions of people participating. So it's not a linear process, but you can say that the, a different vision definitely is being formulated and is, is raising its voice. <laughs>
I wonder what you... Yeah, I, I think that was very cogently put, uh, Fritjof. I'd, I'd just like to add that, uh, you know, individual processes have gone on over the centuries. And uh, processes of enlightenment and maybe a few people influencing many people, paradigm shifts taking place due to a few important minds creating something. But in today what we are seeing is a worldwide movement. It's, we are really being pushed into something as a word. And I think the integration of whatever has been received, which is more enlightened, you're talking about the first half of the 20th century, or even the 60s, uh, or 70s, uh, what, what we see there to get integrated into the more unconscious parts of the world uh, is a struggle. Uh, enlightenment is a struggle. And that struggle is not something being done at an individual or a small level anymore. We are all being pushed into it. It's, it's, a, it's a collective uh, struggle. And whether we come out of it successful or not is, is really a, a kind of a matter of intensity of aspiration and activism. It's to be seen. And, and let, let me uh, add on that that I completely agree with you. It's by no means sure whether we come out of it whole. Mm -hmm. But if we do, we will only do it with a new way of living, a new way of governance, governance a new way of relating to the earth. Yeah. And that's what we're working on. Because uh, we are, we are well, I, mean, I, for myself, now at my age, I'm supporting the struggle. I, but I don't organize in the streets. It's not my thing. But I am preparing ourselves, helping to prepare ourselves for the alternative, which will be necessary if we make it. OK. Well, I see several hands. I think yours was up first. Thank you. Along those lines, what are your thoughts on deep adaptation and whether we really have gone to the other side and it's inevitable that you know that humans will be endangered in the next few years um, and if that is the case what is the preparation what how are, how do we prepare for becoming resilient and for surviving this possible extinction yeah. well I, I don't <laughs> have uh, detailed uh, ideas about that but I uh, I think it's important to, to recognize and clearly understand the difference between mitigation and adaptation. And the difference is that mitigation that is preventing uh, the climate crisis to get worse by planting trees, by moving to sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture, by uh, you know, moving to uh, non-fossil fuel energies and so on. By doing all that, we will uh, you know, mitigate the effects of climate change, and the effects are felt most by poor people around the world. And they will uh, profit, benefit from that most. So mitigation benefits poor people more than rich people. Adaptation benefits rich people more than poor people because they, they have the money to surround themselves with walls and to build the houses higher up and to do all kinds of things. So if, if we say it's too late for mitigation, then we, we give up social justice at the same time, or environmental justice. Devashish, do you have something oh, to add? Not, not much, except that uh, you know, we teach eco-resilience and eco-psychology in East-West psychology. And uh, there is the attempt to create a certain kind of a consultancy of, or help by which we can empower people to be resilient in, in this uh, change that we are experiencing. Uh, when you were talking about uh, the fact that we don't know if uh, stones can have consciousness and can think, I was reminded of the experiments by Jagadish Chandra Bose, 
He did it more than a hundred years back, and he he had devised his own instrument where he could he could see the graphs of feelings that metals go through. He did it with plants and vegetables, and he did it with metals also. So I was just wondering if all that data is lost, and if it is valid data, and if it is valid data, then how is it that it is lost? Because I think it can really extend the discussion on consciousness. Yeah, I, I don't know about this work. This is one of the many Boses that exist in India. There are many scientists called Bose in India. I don't know which, which one it was. But uh, let me say that uh, when you have a coherent view of life, then feelings and emotions are part of that view. Uh, I rely here very much on the work of Antonio Damasio, who says that emotions are a very basic uh, reaction of living beings uh, to you know, environmental threats or some other kinds of uh, disturbances. And they exist uh, not only in human beings, but in animals and even plants. They go very far back in, in evolution. And then he says, feelings is an emotion made conscious. That requires then consciousness. So that fits within a whole coherent framework. The, the feelings recorded of a rock just doesn't fit. It, it would need much more of an explanation of the, of the coherence with, with all the rest of it. But anyway, I don't know the work, so I can't really comment on it. Yeah, there are actually two important bosses. <laughs> one is Satyan Bose, who got the, did some work with Einstein. Yeah, yeah, the, that's the one Bose, I know. Yeah. Bose Einstein, yeah. Einstein Bose. And the other one is this Jagadish Chandra Bose, both, both from Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And Bose, Jagadish Chandra Bose, uh, he actually was one of the co inventors of wireless, wow. but he also did extensive uh, botanic research. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and I think the work of the, the book of the Secret Life of Plants celebrates him quite a bit. Um, there is an institute uh, that he set up, the Bose Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure to what extent they have extended these researches that he did, because the problem with these researches is that they need a lot more work to really not necessarily validate, but to make more you know, systematic, and that needs research, and I don't know how much that has been done. Um, Fritjof, I also wanted to talk about the stones, which is why. <laughs> um, so I was really struck by what you said, that um, are not being able to observe the life or the feelings or the emotions and stones as scientists um, let's gets us to deduce that you know they are, are dead they don't have life and I'm, I'm positing this statement against um, other learnings from from elders and in indigenous shamanic traditions earth traditions about stones as elders, as the repositories of memory, repositories of the kind of frequencies that the humans, human, that human allies can access, right? To um, do multiple things, to, to shift to multiple states of consciousness. And I know that Devashish brought his own um, um, take onto, he brought his own argument into this. So I'm just like sitting with the role of science and sitting with the role of scientists, of the scientist. And is it that systems theory itself needs to re-examine what it means to do science? And is it that the model of observation is no longer adequate? And is it that maybe we need to be open to other models if we are to really uh, seriously take systems theory to its logical extension, wherever it needs to go, is it that the role of science itself needs to change, right? And well, we uh, maybe, but you could also say, and I, I would say, you know, science, as I said, beginning, we have models and theories, 
It's not the only way of knowing, it's one of many ways of knowing. And why not stick to the scientific empirical method which has been very successful? It has had excesses which we can correct. But uh, to say that, as you say, if a stone records human frequencies, well, frequencies of what? We should be able to observe that. A frequency is something that can be observed unless you use it as a metaphor. And then, you know, it's, it's not in the realm of science. So I find it useful to stick to science if you see it as one of many ways of knowing without, without any, any pretense of, of being the best or the, the dominant or whatever. Well, and, and I'll just push this a little bit more. Uh, it's the, f the, the fact is that the, uh, if there is a similar metaphor slash knowing about stones across many different paradigms, it's possibly because there has been a, a, a kind of codified understanding, a kind of codified knowing that has come down through uh, the, the, the different elders, the different you know, streams of knowing. So it's, yeah, I think for me, even the notion of like science as something that's based only in empiricism itself, like I, I, I kind of like stop there and I wonder if there are, if this particular definition of science is leaving out a more expanded definition of science. Well, as, as, as I said, you know, why, why not call it poetry? There's nothing wrong with calling it poetry or philosophy. It, you, don't, you don't have to call it, it science. Let me, let me give you also an example, a personal example. I grew up in Innsbruck in Austria in the Alps, and uh, I still have an apartment there and go there quite often. And I have a very long, strong relationships to the mountains. There's a huge chain of mountains that I can see right from my bathroom. And uh, I have a very strong relationship to the mountains. They, uh, I resonate with the mountains. They are part of the bond to the hometown that I feel where I grew up. And that's all to me, you know, expressed, if you wish, by that rock. But I don't need to say that the rock is alive and has feelings to feel that. It's just my human relationship to it. Yeah, but uh, Fritjof, when you mentioned that cognition goes all the way down, uh, theories in Sankhya as well as Tantra, for example, will actually posit that cognition goes all the way down, that, that it actually goes into the rock. And so they are going to propose methods by which you can communicate with the rock, because that has mind as well. It has a certain kind of mind, yeah. and you will be able to communicate with it. You can get information from it that it will yield to you. So these are experiences, not imaginations. Mm -hmm. And we can, of course, talk about what kind of experience is it, but a science can arise out of that. And so that would be an extended way of using experience to kind of uh, arrive at new ideas regarding reality rather than observing it from the outside and making conclusions. Yeah, I agree. And uh, we, we just should uh, make distinctions and say that, that the cognition I talk about is something that arises when there is some organization which is very different from a crystal or a rock, which is self-organization which, which uh, has evolution in it and all kinds of things. And that's when we talk about cognition. Uh, when you talk about cognition of the rock, you should call it something else or, you know, sure. the, 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 to where I agree with Fritjof is that uh, frameworks have boundaries. Yeah. And so long as we don't take them as absolute, we can accept them as having those boundaries that are stated and then certain results come out of that. Different ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to just comment um, the following. Is science, right, is uh, historically has been predominant white European, as 
it, it is now, right? Like, uh, that is the history of science, the science that we are talking about. But it's other sciences there that doesn't have this scientific way of seeing, and I'm talking about Hispanic scientific people that look to the stars in, in Mayan technology or Egyptian you know, science, science. They were scientists. Um, so I just wonder if we, at one point, we are going to equalize others with what we call scientists or science. Because it is science, but we need to accept. There's not this, thank you for coming about the other points of views and knowledge, but the most important part for me is like when we are going to actually value that and then say, well, yeah, for other people, the rock is alive because it has molecular components. It no will not be present. And, you know, like uh, quantum mechanics says, we are all molecular parts, right? So for me, it's just more about the social acceptance of scientific methodology from the white perspective, men, patriarchal men. And what happened with the rest of the world? Like, what is that? What is the rest of the world? What? It's just shamanic and all, oh, yeah, it's just traditional, indigenous, whatever. But it's not. It's another, it's like the real important way of seeing life. And then we need to equalize everything. We need to equalize that and make it a factorial existing reality, right? In order to move forward to a different existence than this planet Earth. Integrate. Uh, integration, yeah. exactly. I think she was a comment. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's very valuable. And, yeah. and uh, you know, that uh, there has been some work, but not enough, about the kind of sciences you mentioned. For instance, I heard about uh, Indian sailors at the time of Columbus and Magellan and these, uh, you know, Spanish and Portuguese sailors that sailed right the world, around the world, and, and Marco Polo also who would have never got to China without the, the, the Indians helping him. And they could read the waves and they could read the winds and, you know, as you say, look at, at the stars. They had a very detailed way of, of navigating. Uh, you know, there's also, of course, traditional Chinese science, like in, in traditional Chinese medicine, which is a science of patterns, and not a science of, you know, building blocks. And so there, there, there are many of these sciences, and uh, I, don't, I don't know who studies them. Yeah. But that, that's partly what I meant by uh, it's our aim, at least in East-West psychology, to allow those forms of science to flourish and communicate with other frameworks. This is a question from the Zoom, and it's on, it's on the same lines, and I think it's more directed at, to Debashish. Um, somebody's asking uh, in East-West psychology, how would you define East-West, and whether that would also include North-South? And, um, and there's a second part to the question, which is, uh, would you expand on the decolonial and racial aspects in your fourth category named world? So yes, und undoubtedly uh, the term East-West psychology has a historical background and so it's a little anachronistic from that point of view. East-West is a dialogue of civilizations. North-South is more a dialogue of plural cultures. You decentralize it even more to talk about North-South, not just large civilizations. And we are, uh, you know, uh, involved in that, in the, in the sense, as I said, it's uh, both Eastern, Western, and indigenous uh, forms and modes of knowing that we are bringing together in, into dialogue, into conversation. And uh, what was the other question? Un, uh, decolonial and racial aspects in the fourth category of world right. within the department. That's really cultural psychology and activistic psychology. Today, we are addressing that to some extent, but not that much. But that is an important category, really important category that, that I would see, uh, that I would like to see 
develop more in East-West psychology. There are people who have worked in those areas, but I would like to see that uh, taught and explored more. That's you know, the, the first time I went to India, I left from San Francisco, and I took a plane that went west to go to the Far East because I went by Tokyo. Right. And that had a real, as a European, that really had an effect on me because I always thought of India as the Far East, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I heard the phrase social network used, and I think other people of a certain age probably thought of the same thing, which was the internet. And it occurred to me that the internet contains many of the sorts of features of systems that, sh that you identified. It's, it's, it's a network, obviously. It's self-organizing. It, it, it even contains a certain amount of, a fair amount of self-reflexivity. So my question is, uh, is it possible or does it make sense to think of the internet perhaps as giving rise to a new level of consciousness or a kind of consciousness? You know, I even hear people on the internet use the phrase hive mind sometimes when referring to people engaged in a discussion on the internet. Does that make any sense to apply yeah, that Yeah, absolutely. This is a very interesting field of study, which I'm not very familiar with. But when you say the internet, you don't just mean the technology. The, you mean the internet and the humans who use it, right? Mm -hmm. And post things and, and do all kinds of things, in, including some very awful things, you know, like Facebook and, and stuff <laughs> like that. Uh, that, that have recently come to light. So, so it, the internet, when you say the internet, you're talking about a kind of hybrid network, which is a human network and a technological network mixed together. And, and uh, I know one social scientist who has studied that quite a bit, and, and he's a professor in the UK uh, at the University of Lancaster, I believe. His name is John Uri, U-R-R-Y. And he has studied these hybrid social networks, you know, human and technological networks. That makes absolute sense. So you see one, one of the uh, kind of media theorists, Marshall McLuhan, uh, though he is pre-internet, was already predicting that this would be sort of like the fulfillment of uh, philosophers like Derrard de Chardin, who was talking about a kind of a cosmic mind, a new sphere. Uh, but at the same time, what is really remarkable is that everything in our world gets appropriated by capitalism. And so the internet becomes really an infection, uh, an infection, uh, kind of almost like a, a, a kind of an epidemic of capitalistic uh, conditioning. So we have to see uh, not just the utopian and idealistic possibilities of these things, but what is really happening with them. Uh, somehow, um, the fact that the, the technology works so fast, you know, because, you know, photons move at the speed of light, uh, and it's so, there's so little friction compared to mechanical machines, has, in my view, has had an, an important negative ethical effect. In the old days, you know, people were lying and cheating forever, you know, some, <laughs> not all. But, but in the old days, people who were, who were say, falsifying accounts in a company uh, did so at great risk. And so it didn't happen too often. It happened, and some were smarter than others. But there was a sort of a natural friction because the process involved ledgers and then, you know, calculators and so on. But today, with computers, you can deduct, you know, half a cent from each transaction without anybody noticing it. And, and you have billions of transactions, and you put that half cent into your own account, and, you know, you become a millionaire. <laughs> and it can be done with computers because they're so precise and so fast. So I view it as the friction, the, the sort of ethical friction that always existed and prevented people 
from being, you know, real uh, major crooks is not there any longer. And, and somehow, uh, you know, the business world has adopted a completely, you know, non-ethical or amoral attitude, and it's now spilled over into politics. And, and you have politicians who are corrupt, who were never supposed to be corrupt in, in the past. Like, I don't know, in countries like Switzerland or Belgium or the Netherlands, where you thought, you know, these were true democracies, but they're just as corrupt as in other places because the computer technology enables this corruption. Yeah, I have a question to see so now extending the question on the stone being away. Uh, because, see, you. The Tao of Physics was written in the 70s, and perhaps uh, you had some kind of a, uh, if I can be permitted to use the word spiritual or mystical experience, right. which prompted you to bring physics and spirituality together. So, if you yourself has experienced that, I'm sure there is some change of consciousness within yourself. So, given that personal experience, which I could have continued also, as you referred to, going back to the uh, stance of a scientist and uh, uh, adopting a particular Santiago school framework, and to start seeing things again from that perspective. How do they go together? Because the you know, change of consciousness is primary for all these experiences. If the indigenous people in the North America or in any other country, or Indians, our rishis, our yogis, they underwent transformation of consciousness and at that level, they were able to experience world in a different way. And the research on altered states of consciousness and many people's experiences have reported, even in the West. Of course, you know all that. So you yourself have undergone that experiences also, perhaps. <laughs> so now, uh, automatically, again the observer-observed dichotomy, why it should operate in the thinking process. Yeah. Well, I would say that, that, as I said before, the Santiago theory regards cognition as an embodied process characteristic of all life, and that means that most of it is unconscious. For example, when we digest food, it's a cognitive process. It's a self-organizing process, and it is unconscious. And so, uh, human consciousness, in terms of self-awareness, conscious lived experience, is sort of the tip of the iceberg. You know, underneath there's this vast, as Jung also said, the psyche is, is much larger. And we are only at the beginning of integrating these other theories and experiences uh, into, into this uh, Western scientific view of, of mind and consciousness. And uh, I think it will be fascinating to see how especially Indian views of consciousness in the various schools of Buddhism, for instance, or in, in other uh, spiritual traditions, how, how they compare to, to uh, the Santiago school or can be explored from that perspective. So that's only beginning, and, and I really can't comment on it any further because this is work still to be done. Yeah, I, I think uh, Varela himself was very interested in that right. dialogue and neurophenomenology, which is really not, not Varela's uh, sort of coinage, but basically he promoted that way where phenomenology and cognitive uh, science can uh, validate each other, so to say. It's a possibility. It's, these are dialogues. And and he, he also was a practicing Buddhist. Yes, he was. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah.
So, <clears throat> um, we were talking about the idea of emergence, and I wonder, do you think about the question, what could be the cause of emergence of a higher level of, of network or system? So, I see that maybe there will be two kind of cause that we can you know, imagine. One is a top-down causation, means there is an attractor or a purpose, a direction for the lower system to birth out of something higher than itself. For example, the human consciousness come out of the lower level of consciousness in animal or in just in life general in general, or the second um, way of thinking is that the lower level of self-organizing system, the complexity of it hit a certain level, and then inevitably a new system emerge without any necess necessity for a purpose or a teleology. So, which one would you believe in, and what would you think is the implication? If you think that way, what do we mean? Then how do we consider the human consciousness, especially in our time? Are we, do we emerge as such a complex, sophisticated, self-reflective, egoistic beings by the luck, or because nature just happens so, or we come out of some of some purpose. Well, uh, uh, what what we write about in this book is that both of these exist in life. There's the 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 top down causation and the one from from the bottom, and they interact with each other. I was just looking. We have a, a diagram somewhere in the book that shows the interaction of of those two. And, and uh, it is not necessary to believe in a higher purpose. It may or may not exist, but that's not part of the model. But just in complex organisms, you have this interaction between top-down and, and bottom-up. Both exist. So th these would be frameworks. Uh, and <clears throat> again, frameworks have their own assumptions, so to say. And those who have posited a top-down uh, kind of causation, uh, you know, either they are doing that out of experience, mm. and th this is also possible. You have there again. We go to Indian psychology and experiences of uh, higher consciousness, and then making that accountable to evolution would create another kind of model. But that is done through its own, I mean, if you talk about it as a kind of science, it's done through its own experiential system. While this is valid in its own way, if you look at some of the texts, say, for example, the Rig Veda, that has both these systems being presented. You have a theory of creation, which is the Purusha Sukta. A, a being is fragmenting itself and becoming the multiplicity. And you have the Nasadiya Sutta, which is really a bottom-up. So these are models, and you know, each model has its own perception, a way to look at things, or look at reality. And each one has its own, uh, you know, I mean, results. Or it offers something to us which is unique. Yeah. It's just interesting to me that at the biological level we distinguish, I just looked it up, this diagram, it's, it's known as downward causation and upward causation. And biologists now study the interactions of those two. First of all, I'd like to thank both of you and everyone who's asked these excellent questions. I'm so grateful. Um, in response kind of to the question about what do we do, well, two questions, what do we do about racism and the nationalism and sexism, all that stuff that's sort of blocked our forward movement as humanity and our ability to include all voices and so also speaking to the question about including more voices in the scientific world. I'd like to ask your um, thoughts 
on two concepts, where and how they fit into your model, the system's view of life, and also psychology. And Debashish, I think you actually asked about this first concept. But where, and I ask this question with lots of hope, um, on behalf of humanity and all of our need to help us evolve and deal with all of our crises that we've created, where do you and how do you fit the concepts of freedom and love into your models? Well, uh, freedom, I have a very good answer. Love, I'm not so sure, uh, but I'll find something. Uh, but uh, freedom, this is a major uh, advance, I think, on this age-old question of determinism versus free will. And it also goes back to Maturana and, and his theory of uh, self-generating networks. Um, basically, if I can just summarize this, this is not an easy uh, concept. So, uh, a living network, according to Maturana, interacts with the environment by noticing disturbances and responding with structural changes to them within the system. And it will do so out of its own organization. The environment triggers the structural changes, but not, does not determine it, because the, the organism has a certain autonomy or self-organization. More than that, uh, the organism will not respond to any disturbance. It will select particular disturbances according to its sensory apparatus. We know that, for instance, in this room, there are radio waves going through the room at this very moment. But we don't perceive them because we don't have the sensorial apparatus to perceive radio waves. So, you know, for us, they don't exist unless we know through some other source. But um, so uh, a living organism decides not only how to respond, but what to respond to. And it will respond to uh, things according largely to its structure. That's how, how Madurana calls it. So its sensory apparatus, all its self-organizing processes that it is capable of, of. So a bacterium will have a very limited range of responses and of perceptions, and then the higher you go in evolution, the more sophisticated it becomes. So. Living systems respond to environmental disturbances in their own self-organizing way according to who they are. The response is determined, if you follow this, the various steps, but it is determined by the structure of the system. Therefore, it is self-determined. And this is what I would call freedom, uh, Maturana talks about structural determinism. So it's determined, but it's not determined by the outside. And if I determine how to respond, I have the feeling of freedom. But it's still determined by what I'm capable of according to my biological structure, by, of course, in the human realm, by the culture, by uh, my, my inheritance, by my genetic makeup, and so on. It's determined by a lot of things. But they are all things that are inside myself, that, that are proper to myself, and therefore I feel as free. So the answer is that living organisms are both determined and free. To me, that's a major breakthrough. I, I, I think that's a wonderful answer. I, I, I'd also like to say, so freedom is intrinsic. There is a certain freedom. That's again where we come back to the subjective. Uh, subjective freedom exists within bounds, always within bounds. Uh, I also feel that when we talk about freedom, there is from bottom up a straining and the limits. There is always a degree of understanding of those bounds. And freedom within those bounds, but also a, a kind of a push to go beyond those bounds. And that push is partly responsible for evolution. 
at the human level, we have the same. We have various forms of freedom within conditionings. And that freedom is actually something which can be utilized to be free even in bondage. This is what Michel Foucault is talking about regarding technologies of, of, of consciousness. But being free with, within bondage is not necessarily enough. You know, we always train to break those bonds, break social bonds, break psychological bonds. And the more aware we become, the more we look for a greater freedom. So this is part of our characters. Uh, you talked about love. And I, I see it in terms of these various consciousnesses. So the emotional consciousness is its own kind of consciousness, which has intelligence, wisdom, intuition, sense of unity. And these are things that we've suppressed due to the privileging of the mind. And I think that's where we come to the need for empowering these things. Uh, regarding love, I remember a book uh, which uh, inspired me very much uh, by a German biologist called Andreas Weber. And his book, I believe, is called Matter and Desire. And he uh, is a student of Varela's, so he's completely familiar with the system's view. And he talks about love in a way that is, uh, you know, very novel from a science point of view. But I'm afraid I can't reproduce what what he says I don't I don't remember it in detail it's quite complex but if you want to look it up it's called matter and desire it's a it's a it's a beautiful book uh, and I think the subtitle is an erotic biology and he's uh, he is not only a scientist but also a romantic in the German tradition so he writes about his own experience of nature lying down in a meadow in Italy and so on. It's very, very romantic, but he, he talks about love in a very interesting way. Uh, many people I know, and it seems a large part of the country, is consumed with existential angst and fear and dread over both climate change and the threat of extinction and the political situation. Might there be a benefit in trying to promulgate the knowledge of the Upanishads more as a way to gain the freedom to deal with the problems we have without being consumed by fear and anxiety? <clears throat> I, I feel that <clears throat> Making these things available is good, but promoting them in a propagandist way doesn't help. Because it's received in a way which doesn't really turn into knowledge. So it's, there are the old uh, parables about teachers going from door to door and asking whether people wanted salvation and they didn't have any time for it. So it's until a person is ready, you know, you're talking about existential angst. If that angst awakens a readiness to receive, perhaps things can come. But if there is a closure in the angst, in the bubble of the angst, there is no way out of it. That's something we address through things like eco-resilience, you know. How do we create a resilient community? I should add that uh, I was uh, very deeply influenced by uh, a saying in the Bhagavad Gita uh, where, where Krishna tells the warrior Arjuna that uh, he should strive after action without desire. That was, the, the Gita was the first Indian text I read in 1967, I think. And uh, before I read the Upanishads and, and Buddhist texts and so on. And that had a, a really profound impact on me because it was really something new. I'd never heard this before. 
and uh, you know it was just uh, a wonderful inspiration. So I think it can be very inspiring. I guess I was ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go back to one point that Abashish brought, there was this idea of intuition of uh, uh, unity, uh, to preserve the unity like that networks uh, have and the organisms have within networks. It made me think about the idea in science of like feedback, right? Giving and receiving information in different ways and kind of moving towards preserving the network based on this feedback giving and receiving. Um, so I'm kind of connecting that in my head with this idea of intuition um, as like also a way of giving and receiving feedback. And in that sense, I thought about patterns and conditioning and habits and how much we are kind of designed to follow uh, higher or bigger, stronger patterns. Uh, that sometimes we are not totally conscious of, sometimes we are choosing to follow a pattern. And that thought brought me to think about um, this idea of destruction, right? That we are imagining the human being as so powerful as to able to actually destroy itself or the earth. And when I thought about that, I kind of imagined thinking about like a child as if the child is as powerful as to kill its own ancestors. So I was thinking, how do we actually believe in this amount of power to destroy and we fall like so much prey of this uh, sometimes fear of the destruction? And, um, and in that sense, it made me think, what are the things actually present there in the networks of life that end up preserving life so it doesn't get fully destroyed, although parts of it might uh, eventually get destroyed in a certain part of time, but then things emerge and get renewed in one sense. Um, so within all of that, I was thinking about like changing of patterns and this idea of mutation as something that could, in my head, uh, I thought about it as like an unconscious force to bring things back to unity. And uh, I thought, I don't know, about cancer, like a mutation of cells can actually kill the system, but it can also, also like call for a big change in the habits of that very system so it can um, move on and thrive. So just in these different perspectives of like science, as you see Capra and Devashish, as you see spirituality and science and epistemology of knowing, uh, what well, we, you could talk about the idea of mutation. Well, thank you for that stream of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, I would just comment on, on one point when you asked what makes life preserve itself. It's not a single thing. It's, that's what life is all about. You could say the very nature of life, or if you wish, you could say the meaning life, the meaning of life is to constantly regenerate itself. So if we want to adopt this in, in our society and culture and politics and everything, all we have to do is put life into the center. To know life and, and to put it into the center of uh, our politics, of our economy, of our architecture, of our education, our healthcare, everything. Once you understand life from this systemic viewpoint, that it constantly regenerates itself, regenerates itself. That's what sustainability is all about: constant regeneration. I, I agree with that. I think life has regenerative powers, but I also think to your point of uh, how could we be so powerful as to destroy something which the centuries have made and which surrounds us at, at all levels. I don't think we are that powerful. I think we have split ourselves away from the power. And I think we are, in a sense, uh, we, we've lost that connectedness. That's what I was mentioning about the, the ability of the mind to become so isolated because of its sense of individuality. 
then it loses the, the larger power of regeneration that uh, holds us together with all other creatures. And, you know, some people talk about a distinction between instinct and intuition, with the mind in between. You see? It's almost as if instinct, the instinct for regeneration, the instinct for life, the instinct for maintaining unity has been subordinated to something else, the thinking process. But it's really raising it to another level of more conscious intuition, but at the same time, opening up those things that we've suppressed that can bring us back into those kinds of uh, senses, uh, natural sense of unity, you know, which life has. Um, thank you both so much for this beautiful conversation. I'm really um, inspired by it. And I wanted to ask, what is your favorite origin story? <laughs> I actually mentioned uh, there are two origin stories in the Veda. And then there are stories later that uh, nuance this further. Uh, it's a study I'm making, actually, uh, of, of these origin stories and their relations with each other in the Indian tradition. But uh, the origin story that I'm talking about is that of, uh, it's, it's not anthropocentric, but it's, it's as if reality is a person. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a plural person that is one, but also wants to know its own infinity, its own manyness, its multiplicity, and it fragments itself. So it's a little, to put it facetiously, like Humpty Dumpty, who falls from the wall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put it together again. So now we have the fragments, but each of the fragments is the one that has fragmented. And the journey of life is that of each of these ones recognizing that it's not really a fragment, it is the one. And its oneness is best experienced as the all and the interaction of the many. That's it. <laughs> well, my, my favorite origin story is, story is the pre-Hellenic myth of Gaia. Gaia is the Earth Mother, who is the creator of all, who bears gifts for all living beings on her surface, and who accepts all living beings into her body when they die. And and regenerates life in this way. So that's my favorite. So. All right, we have time for I think probably one or maybe two more. So, anybody who's been waiting patiently, okay. here we go. I'll try to be brief. First thing, um, you have you have told us this story about oneness and unity, and I wonder if we also need to learn about multiplicity and pluralistic approach, which you have already emphasized too. And then I wonder if otherness is a key, our ability to digest relationship with what is different, challenging, etc. So otherness might be also very important, important dimension. And then for Frit Hoff, you said about life, purpose of life, self-generating and so. I wonder if it's more than that, in the sense that it's not only remaining, but also searching for more richness 
in the level of expression or depth in the level of experience. Yeah, very, very profound point. Uh, I feel that when we talk about oneness as the origin, we often forget that this, the oneness is also, also infinity. It's, it's the infinite one. The absolute is one and infinity. These two seem to be opposites to the mind, but they're the same. And to talk of an infinite one is to talk about otherness as well. The one is always other to itself in its own infinity. It, there is more to its widest horizon. This is why there can be newness. There cannot be newness if the one is finite, however big it can be. So I, I completely agree with you, and I wanted to bring that up. But you are right about the second point that, that when I say the, the meaning of life is to constantly regenerate its identity, that doesn't mean that the identity stays the same. The identity can also transcend itself and evolve and develop, and that's also part of life. But it's, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't start from zero, it regenerates what has been there before. Okay, we have one last. Oh no, I'm getting, I'm getting the, the sign. <laughs> well, that was a wonderful one to end on, actually. Yes. Thank you. provoking material, so many different mm, looks and perspectives. This was a very, very rich evening, and I want to thank both of you for what you did to unpack some amazing questions from our audience. So, thank you, first of all, to both of you for all that you did to prepare for this, and, and what actually occurred in this spontaneous moment. So, bravo to both of you, yes. Now, I also have a couple of other thank yous, very important ones, and that is to Mira Michelle Kennedy for her orchestration of this whole event. And also to Stefan Julitz and Jonathan Kay for all their technological support, and including live streaming and Zoom platforms. The power behind it all, thank you so much. So with that, I also would like to thank all of you. I mean, I have the, the questions in this audience have just been, well, rem remarkable is pretty much of an understatement. And so I'm uh, once again uh, in awe of what CIS and EWP students can do. So thanks to all of you. Have a safe journey tonight. And um, we look forward to seeing you again in a future event. Let's do it again.